Welcome to the coast. Thank you for tuning in today. We've been talking a lot about love your neighbor, but what does that really look like when it's put into practice? You're going to want to grab a pen and a notebook today because Jerry's going to get super practical right now. All right, so good morning. Good to see all you guys here. Uh, like Jen said at the beginning in her intro, uh, I want you to grab you a piece of paper and a pen. I want to give you a little assignment at the end that'll be uh, kind of a challenge, something to kind of uh, finish up the, the series. So anyway, so we've spent the last 10 weeks challenging ourselves with the thought uh, that we have gotten this thing of Christianity way off track. Um, and we've learned that Jesus calls his followers not to be Christians, but to be disciples, to be learners, to be students. And he told his disciples that the main way that people would know that, that they were his disciples was the, is that they would love one another. And, and we've talked about in the last few weeks about how far off track we've gotten with that and how somewhere along the line we turn it into more about what we believe than how we behave. And, and, and so that as long as you believed right, you could act towards people inside and outside the faith any way that you wanted to. And, and that's caused a lot of people outside of the faith to have a terrible understanding of the Christian faith and a terrible understanding of those who follow Jesus and of, of church in general. And I've always wondered, over the past 2,000 years since the resurrection of Jesus, what would have happened if we had just gotten this one thing right. Here's what Jesus said just before his death. He said, I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, so you should love each other. So last week, we began to look at the question that all of us who are serious about following Jesus need to ask. And I think we need to ask this question daily. And I think we need to ask this question in every decision that we're facing. And I think we need to ask this question in every relationship we find ourselves in. I think we need to ask this question in every situation that we are faced with in our culture. And the question is this, what does love require of me? What does love require of me in this situation? What does love require of me in this decision? What does love require of me in this relationship? This is such a great question, and I wonder, we, we could ask this question in the situations that have played out in our own country over the last few months, the situations of racial injustice and, the, uh, and, and all of that, and the situations of how we respond to all of the COVID guidelines. That if we ask ourselves, what does love require of me in this? What does love require of you? And I want to end this series today by giving you three statements. And, and, and these statements will, will actually kind of take it to the next level. Um, and this is what we do here at Atlantic Coast. Whenever we pick up the scripture, we ask, how do we live this out? In other words, it doesn't need to be, yeah, I believe that. And we just kind of nod our heads and smile and walk out the door. But what am I going to do with that? What am I going to do with the truth that I just learned? How am I going to live that out? And these three statements that I'm going to end with today are going to give you and I the opportunity to do that. And then, like I said, I want to give you a little assignment at the end that'll kind of make it super practical for you. So, so today, I want to take it out of the realm of, of concept and out of the realm of theoretical, out of the realm of just the question, what, what does love require of me? And I want to give you three statements. And, and, and these will help you get better at not simply believing the right things, but these will help you get better at treating people in a way that heals their hurt and actually loves them towards our Savior. Three statements. Here's the first one. Answer, what does love require of you? The answer is, love requires that you do not do anything to bring harm to yourself. Love requires that you don't do anything that hurts you. And do you know why? Because your Heavenly Father loves you. And if you do something that hurts you, that hurts Him. And I think of my own two kids, and, and, and when my kids would do things and I would see them hurt themselves... I actually hurt with them and hurt for them. And why would that be? Well, because, because I love them. Because I love them. You see, love requires of you that you never make a moral decision, that you never make a, a sexual decision, that you never make an ethical decision. Love requires of you that you never make a relational decision, a professional decision, or, or even a financial decision that hurts you. Because when you hurt you, you hurt the ones and the one that love you the most. 
And I hear people all the time, and it's just crazy. They, they throw up their hands and say, well, it's my life. Whatever I do is just, between, is just between me and me. But that is so wrong. And it's wrong because every single one of you are loved. And it's not just your life. And it's not just your relationship. And it's not just your morals. Your heavenly Father loves you. Other people love you. And love requires that you respond by taking care of you because he loves you, and others love you as well. Second statement, what does love require of you? Love requires of you that you don't do anything that hurts someone else. And I'm not just talking about serving in the military or law enforcement. New Testament's very clear about that. I'm talking about our interpersonal relationships. I'm talking about that you just decide that no matter how I see and understand the world and no matter how I view my Christianity, no matter where I am in my maturity, I am not going to do or say anything that hurts another person. And here's why. Here's why. Because every single person that you will ever come into contact with is someone that your heavenly Father sent His Son Jesus to die for. Everyone that you ever come in contact with is someone that God loves just as much as He loves you. Even the people you don't like, even the people who have hurt you deeply, are still people for whom Jesus died. And I realize that this is so tricky for us, and, and you know, it just brings up stuff, and, and, and it involves confrontation, and it's going to involve confession, and it's this confrontation and confession are not things that we're, that, that we're good with, and, and it hurts. But sometimes loving the way that you need to love is kind of like taking out a scalpel and performing necessary surgery. But it's never like taking out a knife. Love requires that you and I decide once and for all that the filter through which our words and our actions come, that, that, that we decide that we will not do anything to hurt someone else. Our words and our actions will not betray someone else, will not deceive someone else, will not tempt someone else, will not abuse someone else or hurt another person. And then last statement of the three. Whenever, uh, what does love require of you? Love requires that you not be mastered by anything. And do you know why? Because when you are mastered by something, when something has the control in your life, it will keep you from loving someone. God said that that's the thing that shows that we're his disciples, is that we love one another. So if we allow something else to come into our life that masters us, that kind of controls us, it keeps us from loving someone. So, so whenever you're mastered by something, it will keep you from loving someone. No one should have to compete with your alcohol. No one should have to compete with porn. No one should have to compete with, with, with drug addiction in your life. No one should have to compete with, with, a, with a gaming or a, or a technology addiction. No one should have to compete with, with a gambling addiction. No one should have to compete with your food addiction. No one should have to compete with your anger. No one should have to compete with your temper. No one should have to compete with anything that seems to have control over you. And as a believer in Jesus Christ, you should refuse to be mastered by anything because you've already said that you intend for God to be your master and be in control of your life. So do you know what love requires of you then? Love requires of you that you get rid of anything in your life that competes with the lordship of God in your life. Anything. Because you cannot love as long as you are master. And so you don't do anything that hurts you, and you don't do anything that hurts someone else, and you say, I'm not going to be mastered by anything. Now, now, let's get real practical here because that's real easy for me to sit here and to look into these cameras and, and you know, know that you're out there. That's real easy for me to say. And as I've gone through this list, it, it, you know, don't be mastered by these things and make sure that you're not hurting someone. You know what some of you have done? Some of you, as I've been going through this list, you've thought of other people. And you thought maybe, I, I sure wish my husband was, was, was watching this. Or I'm, I'm sure glad my wife is, is sitting here. Or I hope my teenager is listening to this. But let me ask you a question. Isn't that the perspective that has caused you to be hurt the most by people who claim to be Christians? I mean, 
what if we decided that instead of worrying about what God needs to teach someone else and the, you know, what we hope they learn and what we hope they get, what if we decide that I'm going to let God take care of them and you just decided this, I'm going to not hurt me. And whatever it takes to get into a place where I'm not hurting me, that's what I'm going to do. Whether it's confession, whether it's counseling, whatever. But you make up your mind, I'm going to break these habits. And then you say, I'm not going to hurt someone else. And, 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 and I will have, if I have to go and make something right with someone, if I have to go face to face and confess some things, I will. If I need to confront someone with the fact that there's something in my life that I'm doing or saying that's hurting them, then I'm going to do that and get that thing out of my life. And I understand what I'm saying may be painful. But you say, I'm not going to continue to hurt them by remaining the way that I am. And I'm not going to be mastered by anything. By anything. Because that means I can't give myself fully over to God and to others the way that I'm supposed to. Now, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Here's what I think Jesus was getting at. And here's what I think we've lost sight of. That when his church, that when those who are his followers leverage anything else but love, we lose our leverage. And listen to me. We, the church, the followers of Jesus, we have lost our leverage culturally. And it's not because we're at war with a group of people. And it's not because of politics, and it's not because of the Democrats, and it's not because of the Republicans, and it's not because of denominations, it's not because of any of that. You see, many, many years ago, when the church got into power, and, and the church got into control, and when the church had the money, and the church had the political influence, we abandoned love, and we began to leverage something else. And on the day that we began to do that as the church, the followers of Jesus, we began to lose our leverage. And what's so amazing is it hasn't always been this way. It hasn't always been this way. And I want you to remember back with me, because once upon a time, there were just a handful of Jesus followers. Just a handful. And all that they had was love one another. They didn't even have the New Testament. They didn't have the writings of Paul. If they lived in certain cities, they may have gotten a letter or two from Paul. Some of them may have read a little bit of Mark's writings, and some of them may have had a little bit of Matthew's writings. These are people, they didn't have Christian books. They didn't have Christian radio uh, stations. They had, no tele they had no internet. I mean, there was nothing. But time after time after time, they kept backing into this one simple idea. What if we love one another? What if we do what Jesus told us to do? And what if love one another is the filter through which we look at all of the Old Testament commands? And what if it's the filter through which we look at all of this new information and this church stuff that's coming in? And listen to me, gang. We know from history, that's how a culture that was corrupt, the Roman culture that had a form of paganism that was so cruel... And we can't even imagine it. That's how that culture was turned upside down. And that's why an entire belief system that was just so incredibly bad just disappeared. Not because the early church had any kind of power, or not because they had any kind of influence or status or politics or wealth, but because they leveraged the only thing that they had. And that was the command of Jesus, to love one another. And they couldn't coerce people into this. People were drawn to this. It was a come and see. Nobody's going to push you in. And nobody's going to push you away. Just come and watch how we love one another. And, and, and you know, when, when people see that, and we know then and we know today, that that makes people feel guilty. But even though they felt guilty, they didn't feel condemned. They felt guilty because they saw what life was supposed to look like. They saw what marriages and relationships were supposed to look like. They saw what worth ethic, work ethic and generosity could look like. And it made them look at their own life and they felt guilty. But they didn't feel condemned. Instead, they thought, maybe, just maybe, my life can look like that. 
And I want you to know something. If that ever characterizes my life, and if that ever characterizes your life, and if that ever characterizes the life of Atlantic Coast Church, and if that ever characterizes the life of the church in America again, we will have leverage like we cannot imagine. But the moment that we abandon love as our primary point of leverage, we lose. The moment we make winning politically, or winning financially, or winning, you know, being socially accepted in this world, the minute we leverage that and say that's where we draw our strength from, and that is our goal, we lose. And not only that, but the people who need Jesus the most lose. You can't preach people into loving Jesus. You can't preach people into loving each other. You can't preach people out of habits. You can't preach people out of addictions. You cannot legislate them out of habits and addictions. You cannot legislate a husband to love his wife the way he should or a wife to love her husband the way she should. None of that happens through, through me preaching at you or through some uh, set of rules that come out. It only happens when it's seen and it's so attractive and it becomes irresistible. So, maybe right here, with you, in your family, with, with the people that you are watching with, with this church, maybe us, we can just start to ask the question, in every circumstance, in every relationship, in every decision, in every situation that we face, we could begin to ask the question first, what does love require of me? And if we begin to do that, maybe, just maybe, it will be said of us, as it was of those disciples in the first century, that by this, everyone will know that we are his disciples because we love one another and we love the people of this world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll give to each of us the ability to know what to do with what we have just learned what to do with the challenge, what to do with the words of Jesus as husbands and wives, as singles, as teenagers. Father, give us the wisdom to know what to do with what we've just heard and then the courage to act upon it. Father, change hearts today, change minds. We pray this in the amazing name of Jesus. Amen. Now, grab your pencil and your paper because here's the assignment. Um, that I wanted to wanted you to do real quick that I think will help kind of bring all of this in. So give me just a couple of seconds of your attention, if you will. 1 Corinthians 13 is a very famous passage in Scripture. If you've been a believer, been in church, you've probably heard it described as the love chapter, and there's some attributes of love. And it's typically read at a, at a wedding uh, service. I've done them for, uh, I've done it at weddings, and it talks about what love is and, and what love is not and all of this. But uh, we, we've got it up on the screen now. And, and these are the things that it says that love is. It says that love is patient and love is kind. We talk about what does love require of me? It requires us to be patient. It requires us just to be kind. Um, that that it, it's, We're not going to be jealous. It's not going to be proud or boastful or rude. It doesn't get irritable. Um, I like these next ones. It does, love doesn't demand its own way. You know, my way or the highway. Love keeps no record of being wrong. It doesn't keep bringing up stuff in the past. Love doesn't rejoice in injustice. And love rejoices whenever truth wins out. Now, here's the assignment. So, so you'll write out those things, patient, kind, jealous, just one underneath the other, and, and, and you've got love is in front of all of those. So I want you to, to kind of cross the word love out or just set it to this and write this, write Jesus is patient. And write Jesus is kind. And right, Jesus is not jealous, and he's not boastful and proud. Jesus does not demand his own way. I'm so thankful for this one. Jesus keeps no record of being wrong. Jesus does not rejoice in injustice, and he rejoices when truth wins out. Now, I've called this teaching today fill in the blank, because here's what I want you to do next. We know what love is. And we know that Jesus embodies love. He is all of those characteristics that we just talked about. So what I want you to do today, if you would, is write those characteristics out again. Patient, kind, not jealous, not boastful, rude, all of those. And put a blank in front of them. And then see if you can write your name in the blank. Jerry is patient. 
Jerry is kind. Jerry is not jealous. Obviously, I'm giving this as an example because these are things that I struggle with. Um, does not demand his own way or her own way. Your name keeps no record of wrongs, does not rejoice in injustice, rejoices when truth friends out. Can you fill in the blank with your name? And we've talked about being followers of Jesus. Well, if these are all the attributes of these, Jesus, then these ought to be attributes that we work at in our lives. And so we, we've taken it out of the realm of conceptual. We've taken it out of the realm of, you know, kind of out here somewhere. We've kind of zeroed in and said, here's what love looks like. Love is when you're kind, and love is when you're patient with people. Love is when you don't store up a record of wrongs that people have said and done to you and you can't wait to get them back. Uh, love, you know, doesn't say it's got to be my way all the time. Love doesn't rejoice when we see someone else being hurt or harmed. Love is always going to rejoice whenever truth wins out. So next week, we're starting a new series. Uh, it's called Messed Up. Uh, someone asked me this past week, how would I describe 2020, and I just said messed up. And so we're going to talk about that. Uh, what do you do when things are out of control? And uh, how do you make clear decisions? What do you do in relationships when things are out of control? So we're going to talk about that uh, next week and for the few weeks after that. So thanks for tuning in today. Um, and I really hope that you'll put this into practice in your life. Love one another. All right. God bless you guys. Hi, guys. I'm bringing you the three things we learned today right outside of Taco Shack. This is a place to go if you want the best tacos in town. This came into our area in 2010, and I'm here a little bit early, but if I was here just about 15 minutes from now, there would be a line around the building. So if you do want to come, make sure you come sometime after 11-ish and get in line for the best tacos you can eat. Here are those three things. Love requires that you do not do anything that harms you. Love requires that you do not do anything that harms someone else. Love requires that you are not mastered by anything. All right, guys, that's all three of them. We want to thank you again for joining us, and we will see you next week.